to the Alberta Association of Gerontology, Living Well, Enhancing Care and Services Speaker Series. And today's session is Living Well in Long-Term Care Centers. I am Sophia Kelfen and a member of the AAG and your host. And before we start, I would like to go over a few housekeeping details. We are using Zoom webinar. So everyone is automatically muted and you will not be able to be seen on camera. And um, we've been given permission by the presenter today to record the session. Um, however, the names of participants and any personal information, including the chat box, will not appear or be shared. Um, at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A button and you can use this Q&A button to enter the questions rather than the chat. So we won't use the chat box for the Q&A, uh, only the Q&A button. Um, for the, and you can put your uh, question in there for the speaker at any time, um, but we will only address the questions at the end of the presentations. Um, so I would like to go ahead and start introducing our speaker then. Um, Sandra Hurst is an Associate Professor Emeritus at the University of Calgary. Sandra currently, or Sandy rather, currently sits on the Executive and Board of the National Initiative for the Care of the Elderly, the International Federation on Aging, and AAG. Her continuing academic work focuses on older adults residing in long-term care facilities. And so without further ado, I will now pass it over to our speaker, Sandy Hurst. Thank you. Oh, Sophia, thank you so much. It's a very great pleasure and I'm very, very pleased to be able to participate in this session supported and sponsored by the Alberta Association on Gerontology. But I'm going to declare a bias right up front. I think that long-term care facilities and those older adults who reside in them are one of the most important segments of our Alberta population. And I very firmly believe in the individuality and the uniqueness of each individual I work with in those facilities. So I wanted to declare my bias. We had about 15, 16 minutes to talk about some of the content that we're going to do. So I'm sure you're aware that we're just touching the surface. But if AAG can give you a little bit of food for thought, so to speak, a little bit of suggestions on how to work within the system and outside the system, then that's our intent has been achieved. The full report of the Alberta Association on Gerontology is on our website. We hope you have a chance to look at it and to read it. I will want to thank Vivian Lai very much. She's currently not on the AAG board, but it was her initiative and her thinking and her vision that set this process in motion for us. So Vivian, I'm not sure if you're in line, but thank you. Um, the slides I have really are, are superficial in the way that we're addressing that surface, that need, that need that we have in long-term care right now. And when I consider the adults that we have in long-term care, they're increasingly multifaceted. They're coming in at the age of 80, 85 plus. They're coming in with severe physical and mental limitations. They're coming in with technology that we didn't have five or 10 years ago before. And because they're coming in with those increasing challenges, they require extremely complex care and treatment plans. And yet at the same time, we want families to be involved. We want families to be supported in the ways that work best for them. And I'm using families in a very generic term. Um, we also know though, that when we go into a long-term care facility, most of the actual care of an older adult is done by an unregulated healthcare worker, up to 80 or 90% of the actual physical care. But we know that they have limited formal training for their role, but they're supported by registered nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists, influenced by the side of the, side of the facility, of course. But when you think about working day by day with older adults and really trying to do a good job, those healthcare aides experience burnout, they experience job dissatisfaction, poor mental and physical health, and they can work in hostile environments. 
sometimes they're working at multiple sites because they're casual. So I think you can understand the complexities of the facilities within this province and country. And at the same time, we know that long-term care facilities and their administration struggle with high levels of turnover and chronic staff shortages. You have to understand the context that we're working with here then when we talk about promoting and supporting older adults. We want to give quality care. We want to give the best possible support we can. But we're working to achieve that goal as a highly sensitive task, but probably the most sensitive task in our healthcare system. And our older adults should best be served by a system designed for them not around buildings, not around economics, but a system designed for them. I'm just going to make a, a comment out of the National Institute of Aging out of Ryerson University in 2019 that Canada spends comparatively less on the provision of publicly funded long-term care when compared with other developed countries. That worries me a bit. And I have to address COVID because we're all, it's part of our lives and it's integral to what we do. And absolutely, unfortunately, regrettably, it's providing us with too many painful lessons, particularly considering the vulnerability of our older adults in the system. We know that older adults in long-term care have multiple comorbidities, they have dementia, they have that cognitive impairment that prevents them understanding some of the rules and some of the guidelines we're imposing. But look at the death rate. This again is out of the Ryerson study work, later work they've done. By November 2020, nursing homes reported 12% of all COVID cases, but 75% of deaths. And I've identified to you in the following comment on that slide, some of the factors contributing to COVID. Aggregate living, a high risk of contracting infections. How do you say to an older adult with, with cognitive impairment, I'm sorry you have to stay in your room? And I can think of one lady right now working with her who has been literally in her room until this past week for months. Okay, so think about some of those issues. We know that older adults in a long-term care facility compared to the same age range in the general community population have a 13 times greater mortality rate because of COVID. There are facilities in the United States and nursing homes. Over 500 staff members have died from COVID-19. So we know that the residents are a key concern, but you're dealing with staff shortages and staff deaths because of COVID. And I think it's been termed the perfect storm. I'm not sure such a word is perfect, but it is a storm. And it's something that we need to address. And long-term care facilities have to be a priority for federal and provincial governments in responding to this situation. I put this down here for a minute just to, to reinforce to us that because a lot of our older adult population in these facilities have cognitive impairment and dementia, some of the emerging research is showing us that these older adults have a different disease course and different symptoms for COVID. So think a little bit about an 85, 90-year-old gentleman who may have Alzheimer's disease. How does he express that he's got a sore throat? It may be through banging on the table. It may be through a variety of other behaviors. But as healthcare workers, it's more difficult and challenging for us to recognize that fact. But they have higher mortality rates. And that's extremely concerning to me. And the point for me is that COVID-19 emergencies should not overshadow adequate and quality dementia care for these older adults. Current situation then. What does AAG suggest and recommend from its reviews and commentaries and its research and, and the variety of strategies we use to collect this information? The need for resident-centered care, absolutely critical and core. At the same time, the complexities of dementia care we need to restructure the long-term care facility, including the leadership capacity and support. We need preparation for the work role at all levels of staff. So education critical. We need to prevent and we need to manage infections safely. And we need to restructure that physical environment. And then you have COVID on top of that. Um, so 
I'm going to move on to the next slide for you. Where do we go next, folks? This is a fast, fascinating and, and challenge for all of us. So let's tell you a little bit about what AAG has recommended. And I think we're to be commended for this. Directional policy recommendation. This is the big one, the key, but wow. Transform the long-term care facility system. That's a system change so that it provides person-centered, safe, quality services by competent staff for residents who live in an environment that provides and promotes their quality of life. A fixed first step, step your first step, would be actually funding the system adequately. Our current system, this is my view, be careful here, driven by a focus on cost containment. And yet at the same time, there is a growth in healthcare costs associated with an aging population. And that's a primary concern of the problem that we face today. And the impact of not funding the system adequately has certainly been laid bare. In addition, we need to provide adequate long-term care beds in numbers as needed, not as the first choice, but we need staff to work in those facilities. The second step is to support standard measurement, systematic data collection, and a performance management system. We have to make these tools accessible and standardized across the province. Transparency, openness to data could certainly foster some accountability across jurisdictions. Boy, and I feel I'm rushing folks, but these are the elements that, that I think all of us work with in this system. With long-term care facility reform now in sight, I'm not sure we've grasped it yet, but it's certainly a light that we can see. We have to seize this opportunity to do right for residents and those who work with them. This means moving away from the underfunding and lack of oversight towards a system driven by continuous improvement, appropriate investment, and accountability. And that's what I mean by the term stewardship. Supporting system change and sustainability requires a strong workforce. It requires enabling technologies. It requires accreditation, training, quality assurance, all linked to the stewardship. Elements of service is how do we do the service? How do we provide care? Um, do we believe in routines? Do we believe in structures? How can we make that little bit of a unique difference? And the carers, I include families in that diagram very much. So how do we begin to think outside that box? We all know what the box contains, but how do we stretch the thinking? How do you brainstorm? How do you do some concept mapping to help us move beyond that box perspective? And I pulled out some guiding principles that helps inform my work, which I hope you'll find useful. And they come again from the Toronto Ryerson work, the WHO and CHCA. And I think they might guide our thinking a little bit. They've certainly supported the work that AAG has done. Evidence-informed integrated resident systems. Um, accountability, accountability expressed needs and desires of, of Canadians. What does the literature tell us? Um, and I'll use one of the phrases that was stock and trade in my student teaching years. It's not what one research study shows you. It's what 660, 600 show you. What is the theme emerging in those, in those research days we're, we're reading? What does the system say about Canada? What does the system say about Alberta? And we certainly know the evidence supports the complexity of long-term care. It supports the needs of staff. Two, supporting system sustainability and stewardship through improved financing arrangements and flexibility and funding is really, really important here. Um, a strong healthcare workforce and enabling technologies. And I used enabling technologies because I'm very much concerned about adequate access for older adults and to promote the further adoption of standardized assessment and common metrics. So there's quality of care across Canada. I think many of you may know that there is a national strategy um, currently occurring within the federal government and hopefully that will move forward a little bit more strongly. That links with a national strategy on, uh, on elder abuse currently being worked on as well. So there is increased attention to older adults. 
These are some of the more specific recommendations that, that AAG has made in its report, and I'm only highlighting several of them. What we are advocating is for an increase in the number of direct work hours with older adults. And I will point out that some of you may know that has actually been incorporated into the Ontario budget last, uh, last November. So how many direct care hours? But we want flexibility in some of the funding to allocate to that. It may be that one facility needs more recreational therapy time than another facility. It needs to be more geared for individual residents. One of the other points linked to that is that we want resident rounds. And we talked a little bit about that. Simply going around maybe once a week, once every two weeks with the care team and looking at Mrs. Jones as Mrs. Jones is in that situation then. Um, and not just the, the routine standardized team reviews. We talked about restructuring the long-term care facility culture to a culture of caring. And there's some fantastic people out there in the system. Good administrators, strong staff, strong OT, strong professional teams, and, and strong, um, strong system teams. But we need to continue building on extensive the leadership capacities and capabilities we have both for today and tomorrow. We need to give them leadership training. We need to give them support in place to do their jobs. We need to do their technology as well. Um, we need to look at education of PCAs. And we did that. One of our recommendations was to develop a post-education course specific to healthcare aides and other frontline workers focused on the needs of older residents and long-term care facilities. And we also suggested an increase in compensation salary after they've successfully completed this course. And there is work being done on this in other provincial jurisdictions across the country. And I put in red specifically preventing and managing infections safely. It's, COVID is certainly our main concern right now, but there are other infections, as we well know, influenza being one example, um, maybe even a GI issue coming through there. But think about the social isolation and the loneliness generated. How do you explain to an older lady who's 85, 92, why her daughter can't come in to visit, why they have to look through a window. And, and we know that there is deconditioning and defunctioning that occurs after those sorts of situations. One of the ways to address that is to look at technology support. If you put technology support in, how do you help staff work with the resident to use that technology? How do they work with Zoom? How do they work with Skype? How do they work with FaceTime? And how do you give staff the time when they want to do those, those supports for older residents? But we also want to ensure that every long-term care facility has a minimum of six weeks PE supply. And we want to also look at allotting, um, allocating capital funding. I'm looking at time a little bit, so I'm just going to zoom to this one. Um, the thing I wanted to point out about this slide was many of you may know that in last year's budget, and in the revised mandate list that went to the federal government last Friday, there was an increased emphasis on support to older adults. Uh, primarily in the care of long-term care, but also in the area of um, elder abuse. So engagement is really, really important. And you may want to begin to think about how can we actively engage. And Alberta um, certainly will be a part of this initiative and an active part. Okay, folks, that was my 20 minutes max before we open it to questions. My contact details are there. Absolutely feel totally free to email me. Um, I'm not sharing the PowerPoint, unfortunately, but this video will be taped. I'm going to shot uh, sharing and give it back. You made me rush the fiat. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> that was very good. Um, thank you, Sandra, for that very informative presentation and a very relevant one too right now um, in the uh, especially in the um, in our in the pandemic here uh, with uh, everything that's been going on in long-term care homes um, so we will now move to the Q&A session and there have been some that have come up like I have seen a few come in that uh, ask for the slides and again as Sandy said the a webinar is recorded and so that you'll be able to access the slides through there. 
Um, so the first question here, I'll read it out, is we are finding that the quarantine times and length of time is having a detrimental effect on our long-term care residents. We have seen deaths, not COVID related, but the feeling is due to isolation. When is this view going to I don't know how they respond in the sense you were so right. Um, I would suggest you look at some of the Can Age. It's um, a national initiative by Laura Tamlin Watts that you may have heard of and that I can send you information on. They do a national newsletter with voice in it. And we've talked about that very issue. There is currently no guidelines and it does vary across the country. Having worked with this system, what we're saying is how can we adapt inside the system right now, inside the long-term care facilities? I do know that there are certain facilities right now in this province who have actually opened up communal dining again from restrictions. But I'm sorry, there's, there's no concrete answer until we, until we get more control. We have to deal with the isolation and the loneliness. And the best thing we can do is, is begin to look at our allocation of units and rooms and. Do we have a COVID-free unit that we can actually keep COVID-free and do a little bit more socializing there? How do we do technology to bring the family in some more? Can we set up Zoom sessions for, for families? And that is being done in a number of institutions. So that's probably the best answer we can give. And I'm sorry, it's inadequate. Sophia? Yeah, no. Well, thank you, Sandy. Um, I think it, uh, you know, the little things that you do can really make a difference. So. I think you did provide some insight there. Thank you so much. Another one uh, question has come up about the budget constraints and uh, that more funding is not going to be available here in the short term, um, but what can we do to improve the quality of care being provided to current low paid uh, HCAs in terms of education and training? I think that there are a number of free online Zoom sessions. Well, let's look at it two ways. There are a number of informal strategies, and certainly there has been work done in the last budget and in the legislation currently about looking at the regulation of healthcare aids, where they would be mandated for continuing competency, and even on the listing of what else healthcare aids are available, there is an expectation of competency. So my question goes back is how do they want that, that education delivered? Um, and you may tell me off, folks, I do not believe a quick 10 minute session at the nursing station at 11 o'clock in the morning works. Being involved in enough of them, it doesn't always help staff. I honestly believe that one to one teaching moment where the administration educators go around and work with staff is the best sort of session. The other suggestion coming out of Ontario is a stronger emphasis on the championship program that where you identify key personal care aides with substantive knowledge and use them as a mentoring training session. The problem with that is it may require extra staffing. Um, also, what audio visuals do you have online that are available to staff? Can you bring them in for an extra half hour? And again, that's not always possible because they're costing. Will they have access to some of these online resources? The National Initiative for the Care of the Elderly has some really great online. The Hartford Institute does, because you have to make sure those deals are credible. Um, can we lend, um, if there's any, I can't say there's downtime on a unit because there isn't any. I firmly believe that mentoring teachable moment at the bedside where administrators go around, and I know you're busy, absolutely I know that. I know the educators are busy, but I've seen personal care aid spaces often light up when that, when that administrator works with them depending on how you feel. So again, it's a hard, it's a hard question because you're totally right. But, but I'll tell you one thing we did at the Brenda Stafford Foundation a number of years ago. Um, we had a session that was totally arranged by a couple of colleagues on myself. We didn't charge at all and we brought staff in. A lot of them came in. For, we had 100 people in that room for that day. Now the Brenda Stratford did supply that day for some of their staff, but a lot of the staff came in at their own. The Brenda Stratford supplied the lunch and the coffee, but we had a really full day. So there are other ways to do that. We could do an hour session Zoom for you. I can give you a dozen colleagues now that may be useful and helpful in that area. Um, so next question, Sophia. 
Yeah, no, thank you. And I do want to say too, that typically we think of education as a, a formal education, but uh, what you're saying is really those teachable moments just to stop and think is, can I help in this moment to impart some knowledge? I think that was very powerful. Uh, thank yeah. you. Sandy. Thing I don't, uh, this is my view. I don't think we have an actual action plan for Vinchley to help. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying a formal education plan. I'm saying through continuing care associations, through the online educators, through, like what is our action plan and give a list of strategies and then the facility and the healthcare aid can pick the strategy that works for them. But we have RN to have requirement competency needs. And so we have OTs and PTs and social workers again. We need to have some of, of, of provincial action strategy that facilities can pick and choose from. Right. Thank you. And there's another uh, comment here that uh, says uh, kudos to your presentation. A few of them like that here. Um, and what are your thoughts on small home models like greenhouse model or group homes, Australia? Well, the butterfly home then, I love them. But you're still thinking to a large extent inside the box. What if we started crafting and building congregate living homes? I mean, let me give you a personal example. I would live with my dad who had dementia for much longer than I was able to if my home was restructured and I could find one. And I know a couple that actually built their home specifically designed. Now that's a costing issue. But if you had a core facility home and pod homes around it, where you could work with families and dementia residents, but a smaller home is more personal. It's more attuned. It certainly works well with individuals who have developmental disabilities and a number of those are moving into later years. So I have a bias. The smaller, the friendlier, the better, but there's a cost implication there. Thank you so much. I'm gonna try and plow through as many questions here in the last few minutes. Um, is the Alzheimer's Society of Alberta and Northwest Territories connected with your efforts teaming up? Um, not personally, no, we've been working with Alzheimer Calgary and Alzheimer Calgary and Bob have been absolutely tremendous resources, their knowledge and their skills and their support for older adults with dementia and their families is incredible. Um, Calgary, uh, nationally, the Alzheimer's side have fairly different structures and formats, but certainly the, the Northwest Territories and Northern Alberta had a strong foundation as well. You know, folks with the bottom line is, Go out to anyone who's going to support you. Have the conversations. Those are the really important things because that's the brainstorming mapping. And that's my bias. I love the talking and the learning together. Okay, so another- there is, There's another model. There's one more model out yeah. of Holland that's really, yeah, yeah. really well. We've started here a little bit where the municipality actually takes the responsibility the building, the building long-term care facilities and educating the community. And they've had some fantastic success in Holland, as we all know. And the Alzheimer's Society here and the Brendan Strafford did a little bit of that work, but it requires more funding. Great model. Mm -hmm. um, so the another question here is about technology and embracing it. Um, how do you encourage this in rural Alberta? Rural Alberta right now is a, is a hotspot. It's an expensive spot for a lot of facilities. They also have, have um, uh, what's not, it's not hot. They also have barriers and frames up there. But, you know, as a, as a door to going into a long-term care um, facility in the rural area, I can take my iPad with me. That's my cost. The facility's cost, that's a different issue. It has to be part of the budget. But other technologies that we're not using well enough. Uh, FaceTime works really well. That's a personal cost. Um, Zoom, Skype, any of those. It, it depends on how your, your facility is wired into it. And the rural is such a huge generic area. Even rural areas don't have the same access to technology. Satellite technology works well. Um, okay. Let's try and think out loud. There's a lot of, there's a, there's a Jera Technology Conference every year or so. Um, Gloria Gutman and Simon Fraser, a lot of work in this area. And she may be useful for you as well, because the technology focuses on older adults and how to help them. Yeah, I, I know we're right at one o'clock. Um, and if- you want one more question? Yeah, if folks are okay, we can just probably keep going on for another uh, five minutes or so. Um, I do wanna just say, go, oh, that's fine. Uh, just uh, that uh, we'll be here again. There'll be another session.
session next Thursday. Uh, so feel free to join then as well. But we'll just go on for another question about what, what do you think the role of the federal government should play? And as a side note, there one, there's one comment that says you should maybe run <laughs> run for government. So, <laughs> um, but what role was, should the federal government play, Sandy? I'm stepping out AAG from Sandy here loud and clear. I think the federal government has to begin to get into action. And I am so tired of hearing we have a commission, we have a national senior council. I'm hoping the national action strategy for long-term care will actually get us moving forward. But we have to look at what is the legislation currently. We have to look at education. We have to look at community engagement. We have to look at, at all those factors together. And I, I firmly, this is Sandy's comment totally. I firmly believe we have to have more of a national healthcare system than provincial territorial jurisdictions because I really believe one national system with commonalities will help improve the care. I think we learn better from each other. I'm saying again, so Lynn Mansell won't kill me. That is Sandy's personal comment. Having said that, I do believe a Alberta and AAG and Alberta Health is really trying. I think they're recognizing there's a need. I think there's recognizing a concern. Um, and I think even asking for this report, asking for a serious review, is a step that's saying we recognize we need to change. Yeah, I'm just going to ask one last question here. How do we get the discussion of funding at the table with the AHS groups? I think you have to raise it. You know the elevator speech we all have to do? Do an elevator speech for funding. But, it, but I do believe, too, that a standard written form letter from each of us is useless. An individually written letter as a common grassroots action plan can make a difference. Let me give you an example. There was an initiative recently in Ontario specifically addressing older adults. And they did an individual letter writing campaign. They had over 6,000 letters going. Mm -hmm. So. Great, thank and you. And Dana said too here, I just, we can all see that yeah. one, but. I think if you take one small step and you actually make a comment somewhere, that you speak up, um, that's something I've learned, not always wisely, but I have learned it that one comment done, speaking from what we really believe, and I think the last comment before Sophia cuts, cuts me up is, I want to give quality care to older adults, and I want to work with staff to do so, but to be blunt, and with families, my concern is that older resident I'm looking after and the collective. Sophia? Okay, thank you, Sandy. And you know, we could keep talking about this um, for another few hours, I'm sure it's such I a would love to and so very important, um, but we are at the end of our session and I sincerely want to thank uh, you Sandy for presenting such an excellent session, as well as our participants, um, those uh, of you who had to drop off, but those of you who were able to stay as well, thank you so much for joining us today. As mentioned, the webinar today has been recorded and will be made available. Um, apologies that we weren't able to get to all the questions, um, but uh, we hope to see you again next week, again on Thursday, on February 4th, for our next session in the series uh, in, titled Living Well with Restorative Care. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and have a great afternoon. And stay safe, wash your hands, and wear a mask. That's my standard line. Sophia, thank you. Lynn and Adrian, thank you. So stay safe, everyone.